Hello and welcome to Secrets of a Successful 48. Tonight's topic is going from script to screen and we're joined by Matki Dapp. He is a five-time 48-hour film project city winner and we've actually taken two of his short films to our special screening at the Cannes Film Festival Short Film Corner. Welcome, Mikey. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're glad to have you here. You are a commercial director as well as a lot of directing experience. When did you get your start as a director? You know, my first film I ever directed was a 48. 2007, I had a bunch of people I saw doing it and I thought, wow, that looks like a lot of fun. I'm going to try it. Had very little experience in anything filmmaking except for I watched a lot of films and I have a degree in English. So I'd studied story, you know, writing and I'd written a novel. So it was a brand new way to kind of flex something, a different muscle. So, yeah. And from that very first one in 2007 to when you considered yourself as a full-time director, what, what was the length of time? Nine years. That's so I did. Uh, yeah. So it was, uh, uh, I quit doing my day job. My day job, I was kind of freelance graphic designer, right. um, but I quit doing that in 2016 uh, to be a full-time commercial filmmaker. That's great. Well, congratulations on your success. Thank you very much. So let's jump into our topic tonight, which is is going from script to screen. You've done the 48, uh, what now? Eight, 10 times. 10 times, yeah. So um, why don't you tell us, as you're preparing for the 48, how do you put your team together? Um, any kind of pr quick preparation tip that you might share? You know, it's an interesting process because like anything in the film world, the more you do it, uh, and if you do it with any type of success or you even make things that people like, other people want to join in. And that's kind of how this whole world works. Uh, you make something good, people want to be on your team. If you're really good at what you do, people want you on their team, you know? Uh, so my first, my first year, I actually got incredibly lucky because I had a couple great actors uh, that I, you know, I'd never done it before. They were improv actors. I'd seen them at improv shows and that, so having good actors really helped. And then we had a pretty interesting story and a, a, amazing location. So my first year, a, a lot of really good chips fell for us. Um, so I think one of the biggest things for the 48 is to just find great and, and great people can come in all different shapes and sizes. They can be people who are incredibly th enthusiastic, but have little experience. They can be people who are super seasoned and just want to do something uh, outside of the mundane world that they're in, whether they're making documentaries or they're doing, you know, not that those are mundane, but if you do the same thing for five, six, seven years in a row, sometimes you want to do something to change up your rhythm. Absolutely. And so one of the big things for me when I really started doing this, well, I did it, I did it nine years in a row. I took a year off and then I did it one more time. And that was the last time I did it, which was 2017 was the last year I did it. And every year, once I started getting some success, we won, my, my third year I did it, I won. Uh, my team won best film out of like 47 films. It was, it was wild. Cause, and, and there were, I feel like there were better films. It was this, it was a weird thing, you know, in our, but, but it was really humbling for us. And it really, it got me on some people's radars and it got me energized to want to do it. And so my team in 20, in 2009 was, was really great. But now I had a bunch of other people that are wanting to join on. And so as you, as you continue to do that, as you continue to make them your first year, you might just get lucky with two or three or four really great people. Um, and you're just working hard and you're having fun. And that was the big, thing my first several years it was just this is summer camp we're gonna we're gonna just do this and it's gonna be a blast and it's gonna be the hardest two days but when we were finished we were just like I cannot wait until next year um but as I as I kept doing it that that wasn't enough for me so then it was like okay so now I would love to work with this person and this person I've never worked with them before I wonder if they would jump in with me on a weekend and do this and so part of it is having these nice long-term relationships and part of it is experimentation of wanting to work with new people and try something new out um, and so finding your team just like with anything in the world in the creative world is always going to be kind of a crapshoot you don't know if that person you brought on that is so acclaimed and everybody's talking about could actually be a nightmare. 
you just have, you, you have no idea. No idea. Um, you know, so it, but I think choosing that team and getting people, for me, I think a huge part of my success was finding people who bought into the things I wanted to do. They saw my other films. They kind of saw where I was going creatively and they were like, I want to be involved in that. And they bought in. And that allowed me to say, okay, well, we kind of know the sound sandbox we're playing in. How do we expand the sandbox? How do we shrink the sandbox? How do we use your skill set and change the sandbox a little bit? You know, and I think that was uh, that was a way I grew every year. I would I would push myself a little bit. I would bring new people on. Um, but the people, the team, that was the the thing because every year the films were different because the team was a little different. Right. Well, it's uh, just like in a sports team, you're trying to find the best use of each of the players. What is that particular skill set? What is that person the very best at? And how do I really emphasize his or her skills? So uh, the, you described something I think a lot of the filmmakers go through and, and figuring out the place for every person. Um, so Friday night, do you do anything in preparation of the kickoff what uh how do you what's that last yep. little bit that you do before you arrive at the kickoff i actually do three to four weeks of pre-production um and that is obviously getting the team together working with my producer saying or, or producers in some cases who, who wants to be part what are we building and we, we just kind of start to get the these amazing people and um where are we going to do post-production you know just kind of getting all those logistics how many locations do we have at our disposal so i, I would sometimes location scout for weeks and weeks going and trying to find okay if we were here and we drew western could we pull off western here no okay well just in case we get western let's make sure we have someone who has a great backyard you know so it's always getting some really great options and then um for me and especially as i got more into it but even the first few years finding some great actors who i thought could work well together on screen was always a thing and it was limiting i know some people will just say hey we're gonna get 20 actors on our roster and we're gonna pick five well in the city like nashville when we have 40 50 teams you can't just hoard all the the best actors actors because you want them all to be on screen. You want them all being with teams. So my, as I really started getting into it and really started figuring things out, I would try to limit it to uh, between four and six actors. And um, knowing that I was going to try to do my best to write each of them something a little interesting. Some years I would try to get a little bigger and see, could I give everybody some sort of fun, uh, you know, 30 seconds on screen to really say something cool, you know, so that was always my big thing uh, to, to try to do. But that pre-production and getting all of the post people to talk about what is, how's our process, what's our workflow? Uh, usually my editor would lead that out and say, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And our goal is to wrap by noon on Sunday to get music and audio their stuff, you know, so it was always just an education because you're not all, you know, some people have the luxury of always working with the same 15 people and these are the 15 people we're going to do we didn't do that i mean i had um i won 2014 2015 and 2016 and i had three completely different teams apart from like three people wow those years. Right. um and so teaching everybody my process and how i did it took time and sure. say hey listen i have success because we followed these very interesting, strict um, preparation things, and it really helps us to understand where we're gonna go. So, um, and then the last part I wanna say about pre-production and prep is really knowing who my actors are. Like knowing, watching everything I can from each of them, knowing, just kind of have an interview process and get to know them and go, okay, cool, have you done this before? Are you interested in this? Is this weird for you? You know, and just really figuring out what everybody's boundaries are. Sure. So then when you land on that night and you draw, you know, fem, you know, f film to femme, and you're like, okay, great. I've got three amazing uh, female actors and I've got two really strong male actors. Okay, how are we going to build this and make this really great film to femme or whatever it is? So sure. knowing your actors is, I, I think, is one of the, one of my biggest keys to success is really understanding them. Great. So you've arrived at the kickoff. You get your genre and the character prop in line. Uh, what happens next? What is your writing process? Do you do it by yourself? Do you do any group work? How does, it, how does your team do it? I have done it every single way I think you can physically do it. Okay. 
um, I'm, I'm going to tell a few stories just to kind of give uh, uh, how I tackled different scenarios because I know that everybody who's out there doing this, everybody's scenario is a little, you know, there's a lot of directors out there that don't do any writing. Right. They just say, okay, you guys, you write the thing, send me the script. You know, I might chat with you um, and then in the morning it's mine and you guys go sleep. Um, I was always writer director and always involved in the writing team. So the first few years we did writing by committee. We had every single person showed up and everybody just brainstormed. And I found that after doing that four years in a row that it became kind of a nightmare because you would just waste a lot of time. You would have a lot of people, some, you know, you would chase these rabbit trails and you're like, okay, hold on, hold on. We can't, we can't do that. Well, no, no, but I think it's a great idea. And all of a sudden you just have this weird thing. Um, so, so I'm going to interrupt so, you there because yes, I've been in that exact same situation where you're in the room of 20 and they're great ideas, but nobody can pull it together. And you send basically you kick them all out and 12 midnight, you start all over again. I'm exactly. going to take a break right now because my battery is about to die. So you did it three or four times using the kind of whole group brainstorming process. What what did you go to after that? So in 2013, it was the first year that I wrote by myself. And it was an interesting experience um, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but then again, in 2014, I opened it up again to uh, to more of a group. And But it was a small group. There was just three of us. And I wanted, I, w- I wanted to do a very specific thing with that. And then in 2015, I wrote solo again. But I had two amazing producers that I ended up making uh, my feature film with another version of you and it was we had already filmed a little bit of another version of you and this was a chance where we all got to the three of us got to work together and so at two o'clock in the morning um i let them read the script and they were like I think it's a fun idea and you've got some good stuff here, but it, there's something's not working. I was like, yeah, I know. I, you know, and I was a wreck. And, um, and we, we just joked around and, and we kind of loosened up a little bit and around 3.20, lightning struck. And then I was able to finish the script and we kind of brainstormed. So that was great. 2016 was my only year I, I did it in Cincinnati. And it was with a, almost a completely brand new people. I'd worked with maybe two or three of them in a 48 before. Everybody else was brand new. And I wanted to, everybody who had never done a 48 before to experience the magic. So I devised a brand new way of coming up with ideas. And, I, and it was really cool, um, honestly, for if you've never done, if you have a bunch of you have never done it before, I gave everybody 15 minutes to just brainstorm. Everybody just wrote down on slips of paper, just quick little one sentence ideas. And then me and a small writing team took them all in and we flipped through and we found like our six or seven best from those slips of paper. And then I got everybody together and I put a time on it. I said, we've got 20 minutes wow. and we're going to brainstorm and we let everybody brainstorm and I said okay everybody go home and sleep and then our writing team got together we, we kind of devised something from that brainstorming session now the way I did it is I was like I'm going to write this everybody but I wanted to get this writing team involved and so we we brainstormed we brainstormed we outlined we figured out the beats and then I said okay give me an hour I'm going to go write the script and I'll bring it back to you and then um, we can all tear it apart and figure out what's working what's not working and so it was a really great process if you have a group of people who are desperately interested in writing sure. it was a great way to do it and then uh, the last year I did it completely solo venture again um, and and there's something beautiful about both aspects mm-hmm. and um, but ha- but once again I'm gonna go back to having really good producers who trust you having a good editor who knows you knows what you want understand story structures things like that those are things that really helped us I could pitch them an idea before I wrote anything yeah. and they'd be like "Ooh, that's great Ooh, that's not gonna work don't do that um, and then I would just write and then I would send them uh, edits. And I wrote from my house. It was the first time I'd ever not written kind of in the place where we were mm-hmm. going to film. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just went home because I was having a hard time getting the energy in the space where we were filming and they were starting to do stuff. And I was like, no. Um, and I went home and wrote and it was it was a lot of fun. It was a very refreshing and different way to approach it. So I've tried them all and I don't think there's a right or wrong way. You just have to find what's good for you and, and kind of what you're feeling. But you have to set those expectations early on because if you have seven people that are on your team and they think they're going to be writers and all of a sudden you're like well no no I'm the solo writer you're going to have a, a small mutiny on your hands so you, everybody has to understand expectations before you even get in yeah and I uh, certainly like the way you would set time limits for some things because as I learned and you learn if you let the brainstorming go on until midnight then you're really kind of stuck so set a short time limit and 
get their ideas, but then move on. So now you've uh, worked all night, you've got your completed script. You wake up, uh, well, maybe you don't wake up. Do you do something with it that night? What do you, what, what's the next yeah, step once you got? I wanna say one more thing about writing and then I'll go, I'll go right into that thing. Right. Um, and this goes back to what I was saying about actors and about knowing your actors. Something I really feel was, was a reason that I had some success when I did all the 48s was I wrote to the strengths of my act. And so I remember in uh, in 2016, when we were in Cincinnati, everybody kept pitching these really dramatic ideas. And I said, guys, we have five really great comedic actors and we have to have comedy in this or else we are wasting opportunities. Sure. Um, and knowing who each of them were, uh, it, it made that script so much better because I knew who they were and I, I built them up and, and set them up. So. Um, typically what happens, we write all night. Um, there's been a few times I've, I've finished before too. I think the last year I did it, I sent the script out at like 2.30, which was, which was amazing. I was like, <laughs> I actually got like three hours, maybe four hours of sleep that night. And the location was, was five minutes from my house. So it was like, it was this beautiful, perfect storm. Right. Uh, and it's the reason I never did it again. I was like, I, I, this is too perfect. I can't ever. <laughs> That's, um, so usually, I mean, there's been some times where I've gotten maybe one hour of sleep uh, from the time I, I hit send to the time I had to be on set, you know? Right. Uh, but usually I try to get, my goal is to get at least three hours of sleep. Um, we usually have an early call time. We usually have a, typically we, we run for an 8 a.m. call time because we know it's gonna be a long day. Right. We wanna use as much of the light as we can, depending. Um, I've, I've rarely written films for night, Actually, I don't know that I've ever written a film for night. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say this though before I jump in. I had rivals in Nashville. For for a few years, there was this other team and they we we would take turns winning. And they were, I considered them my rivals. They considered me their rivals. It was a very friendly rival. Ended up once they stopped doing it, a bunch of their people, I, I swiped them up and brought them on my team. Amazing right. people. Their writing process was no writing. They just outlined uh, a beat structure and they did all improv um and so and i and they won they won a few times and so i want to say that just because i don't want people to think that my way is the only way there are so many different ways to do this and if you have really great improv actors who are very comfortable with that and you as a director writer whatever is comfortable they would start filming like three hours after they got their genre and stuff because they would just outline it and they would be like great Let's go start filming, and they would just go. That's impressive. If that works, and it's a, and it's a, yeah. If it works, right. so anyway, so I, I want to go back to my process because I never did that. <laughs> So, um, so usually, yeah, we're ready to go. We've, I, I've, I've emailed everybody out, uh, the script. Um, I've, I, I've, I've already bounced it off a few people, either other writers or producers. We're all, we've all signed off on it. Green light. Everybody's got it. Now I show up on set and this is, I'm now I'm going to speak almost solely as a director because at, uh, for, with a 48, especially once you start filming the writers kind of, there's not a lot of, we don't have time. <laughs> for writers and I and I don't say that in a mean way but I just say that is you have a short period of time to make a film and we can't be tweaking on the on the story the whole time like if you haven't landed it now you just have to just hope and pray that something's <laughs> good's gonna happen so um so yeah now you're on set and it's been interesting I, I, I want to go back to 2015 I had a film uh we made a film called Everyday Yeti it was one of the films that went to the Cannes Film Festival and we get to set and we had a 45 person crew that year with cast and crew. It was insane. <laughs> That's this insane. huge, huge. And so we had this amazing, um, it was a it was a workspace, you know, where, where people can come and they can rent an hour at a time and just, just this huge, beautiful, gorgeous workspace. We converted it to a coffee shop and a cafeteria and, or a restaurant kind of thing. It, it was really cool. We get there where everybody's, I mean, it's like bees buzzing all around. Everybody's going. And I've already assigned most of the people. I already knew who they were because I wrote for them. But I said, hey, you're this character, you're this character. I get a call from one of my actors and she says, hey, um, I have been throwing up since 1 a.m. and I thought I was feeling better. I got in my car and I had to pull over and get sick again. And her house was one of our main locations. Oh, wow. So this is this is this is the epitome of 48 hour filmmaking, right? So I hang up, I go, I go, hey, I'm so sorry. I hope you're feeling better. So we just lost an actor and we just lost a 
location. I'm going to deal with the actor situation. I went to the producers. You guys are going to deal with the location and situation. And uh, we'll get this whole thing worked out. <laughs> and luckily, we had a couple other really amazing actors that were there and just kind of switched, swapped a few things. And it ended up being uh, really great. But, um, but that's kind of this thing where you get there and you have to be prepared to yeah. problem solve. Yeah, and exactly. as filmmakers, that's what we are. We are problem solvers. That is our number. That should be like everybody's resume. I solve problems. <laughs> You know? um, so yeah, that's that's kind of now we're now we're into it. Gotcha. Um, and so my next question is um, specifically working with your cast and your crew. Um, can you walk us through each of those? You talked a little bit about the working with producers um, and your editor, but on Saturday, um, how do you prepare your actors? Let's focus on them. Uh, sure. Well, usually, through. yeah, usually, you know, I I've worked with the same uh, wardrobe supervisor for many years, and so she and I have this this rhythm, and so she brings a bunch of stuff. She gets the actors to bring as many clothes as they can, and by the time everybody's read the script, she kind of has an idea idea of what the vibe is going to be. So now she, she might be calling actors at six o'clock in the morning. Hey, do you have anything that's red and has a really great big giant butterfly color? You know, collar, you know, or whatever it is, right? Um, and so, so a lot of the times I will, I will, I will talk to the DP. Hey, this is what we're gonna do. We'll, we'll start walking through locations. We'll start walking through. Hey, we'll shoot this first, and then we'll do this, and the, you know. So I'm kind of mapping out where we're gonna do things with the DP, getting their feedback. Um, I think I've worked with four DPs on the 48 mm -hmm. over over two years over 10 films um and so the process is always a little different and especially some of them it's my only time i ever worked with them or it was my first time working with them so it, it's always an interesting thing um hair makeup wardrobe uh, i'm you know i try to set that as early as i can so they can just really get to work start prepping act start getting them going um you know i'm letting my my dp talk to the g and e department they're starting to get things set up they're starting to move all the lights in get all that stuff going uh sometimes if i have the the honor and pleasure of having a script supervisor, a script supervisor, or a, or an AD. Um, you know, I'm walking through the schedule with them, walking through what we're going to do, and then I try to give them as much. I try to empower my AD as much as I can to just really try to run the set, so I can really focus on actors. Because sure. in a 48, even more so than than other things, they just got this. They yeah. just they yeah. just got the script, and now they're this character. And they're not you know, so, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I want to make sure I have time to answer those actor questions, to really work through those things uh, and to make sure that we're, we're getting that. And then my production designer, um, you know, a lot of the times we've already talked about, hey, if we... If we're going to be in this location, what can we use? What can we do? Um, I have a style already that is kind of went through a lot of my films. So I'm always going to say, hey, let's bring some mid-century furniture. I'm always going to try to write for the things that I like visually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's not doing creative forehand. It's basically doing, I know we've got these things and we're. I'm going to write something to use the things that we have. Because that's how you do a good 48 is you, you get the best stuff you have. And if your genre fits the stuff you have, you win. And you get to... Just start, uh, you know, playing in the sandbox that you've built. Sure. So now we're getting down to the specifics, and I'm talking with production designer uh, and my DP, and just saying, okay, hey, this is what we're. Uh, and my AD is there, my producers are usually there. So that's kind of getting crew everybody going, and then once we're there, now I'm just going to hang out with actors, right. and I'm there to really dive deep, um, try to give stuff that's not in the script that I can give them. Uh, one of the things about being a director is, and something I've had to really, really learn, is making really really fast decisions and knowing the impact of that fast decision. So for instance, uh, what Yeti wore in Everyday Yeti, um, it was this really whimsical outfit. And I think she had her hair in this kind of cute braid and the, you know, it was really, it was really whimsical. Um, but I remember my, my, my stylist came up to me and said, this color dress or this color dress. And I, I love them both. And I knew that the one that I chose, I would be watching that dress for years and years and years because she was the one character that never changed outfits because she was an imaginary friend. Right. You know, so, and that's part of, that's part of what we do is we make those split decisions and we trust our crew that they're going to bring us really good stuff, right? And so, once again, this is my, um, I don't know, my sixth 48, seventh 48, something like that. And so, I had already had the process of, 
of, of really exercising. And, and by that time, I'd done a ton of short films. Um, I had done a feature film and I had already started doing some commercial work. So experience is a huge thing. And that's, I think that's something for if you're just now starting the 48, give yourself a lot of flexibility and freedom and leniency to just make mistakes, but make them big, like make big mistakes and just really own it and do it um, because you're going to have a chance to do it again. You know, um, and then if you're seasoned, you start going, okay, I've, I've learned from this. We did this this one time. It was not a good idea. Let's do it better this time. And how do we do that? And a lot of that can be solved in pre-production, which is why I think pre-production for the 48 is almost as important as the production because you're solving problems before you get to set. Even though you don't know what your story is and you don't know what film you're making, there are still problems you can solve. Um, so yeah, so now actors, I mean, it's just really getting down and making sure they are comfortable. Um, as the director, that is your job. You if your actors are uncomfortable or feeling weird or can't trust you or can't trust the other actors, mm -hmm. that creates situations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those situations are good and you can, you can build off of them and you can use them as a strength, but everybody still has to be comfortable. Even if they're not fully comfortable with maybe a situation or whatever, um, because a lot of times we're trying to push people, we're making art. Um, the, the actor still has to be comfortable with you as a director. They have to trust that you are not gonna put them in danger, that you're not gonna make them look like an idiot, that you're not not gonna make them uh, look like they don't know what they're doing. They are putting themselves in your hands. And so that's something I take very seriously. And uh, it's one of the reasons that um, I, that I've made so many because I love that process. I love working with, with actors. Well, certainly when it all comes together, there is no greater feeling, right? You're, you, you've, you've got that team all in, your, in the place where you want them and they deliver. It's really great. You've told us before that you have, a, a, you, you write a full script and, and how strict are you in following the words on the page versus having some improv? Yeah. That's great. You know, um, I, I'm going to tell just a couple quick stories just to yeah. kind of show, show that, uh, in 2014, we had a film called Contrary to Likeness. It was an, it was the first film I ever had go to con and, uh, the script was so tight. Like there were so many things that had to happen in it yeah. that we had to kind of stay in. But, but for me as an, uh, as a, as a director, I like to give my actors a little bit of freedom and that if, if something isn't setting right in their mouth or their, the, the rhythm of something is wrong. Wrong, um, I like to say, hey, forget the script. Like you're in the situation, you know, you know this. You've been reading it for the last four hours. How would you say it? And so I like to try to get that um, when I when I have the mm -hmm. ability. But if it's if it doesn't break story, to yeah. let them kind of own it and do their own thing. I'm not precious with my words. Uh, in in twenty in 2015, when we made Everyday Yeti. Once again, it was it was a fairly tight script to be able to convey all sorts of different messages and things. But I, that one in particular, there was two actors who had these very strong personalities. And I wanted those personalities to shine through because if I tried to restrain them, I was going to lose a little magic. Um, even if they weren't saying things totally right or they were doing things that felt really awkward to me, um, I saw the magic in it and I just, I just let the situation play out. Okay. Um, one of the actors who played Yeti, her name was Sarah Antonio. She is still at Sarah Antonio. Uh, I would, she would do it by the script. She would just do it exactly as the script said. And then I would always say, okay, this one's yours. I want you to go crazy. I want you to just have as much fun with this take as, as you can. And nine times out of 10, we use that super crazy where she just got to go nuts take. Yeah, um, so it, it all depends on, you know, your story that you have. She was an imaginary friend, this imaginary character who only existed in one person's head. So she could do anything right. and only the one guy was seeing it, you know, um, and it was perfect for that. And then uh, in 2016, the next year when I did it in Cincinnati, I had these really great improv actors. They were just so good at improv. So a lot of it, I would, I would let those two in particular who are on improv teams and done so much, I would allow them to embellish a little bit and give them just a little bit of extra time mm -hmm. because I knew they were going to give me some gold. Yeah. And they did. You know, so once again, it goes back to knowing your actors and knowing their strengths. I have a couple other actors friends that I've worked with several times and they are really good at just delivering exactly what's on page. And when you get those together, they know their strengths. They know they're really good at just delivering that. The other people are good at improv. There's not a, a conflict. They don't, they don't feel like they have to do the improv because sure. that's not who their character is. I wrote them to be the straight person, you know? Right. 
you ever find yourself on Saturday um, in the middle of the day and you're freaking out because it's not all coming together or you're, you're worried you're not going to get it or, or you've got a very controlled set that you're, you're, you're confident? What's, what's, what are the difficult parts of your shooting, getting it from the page to the end of the can? I think my biggest problems in the past have been too many locations. Right. That that has bit me on the butt numerous times. Uh, what happens when you have more than one or two locations is you're going to have a really long day. <laughs> you're going to have because right. um, each move you're you know hour to two hours for a company move. So my, my last year I did it, I was like, we're only doing one location and we still went way over time. Um, so that, that's a big one is, you know, it's, it's six o'clock. You've been filming since 8 a.m. and you're halfway through your script and you're like, hey, that 12 hour day that we were hoping to get, we're not going to get that, you know? So, and the beautiful thing is that you, you say that beforehand, hey, we're always shooting for a 12 hour day. We've never had a 12 hour day. <laughs> so... Um, just really just try to enjoy this process and uh, try not to be grumpy. And that's the big thing is um, always do really good food. So one of the things that I've always tried to do is I, I have everybody pitch in money and all that money basically goes to food. Right. So that way, if they're pitching in $20, they get two really great meals. Uh, we'll either cater it or we'll have one of the crew who's specifically like a chef and yeah. they'll just make of food so um having good food can sometimes calm the natives if you will you know when they get restless um you know having really good producers and a really good ad and even even if they're not a seasoned ad even if they're just somebody who is going to help you share the burden mm -hmm. that's a huge thing because when you're not hitting it they're all going to tell you hey we're way behind and you're going to obviously say i know <laughs> And then, um, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out uh, how do we get this, how do we get the ship righted, you know? And a lot of times we, you, you, you have to celebrate. You have to go, yes, we're three hours over schedule, but think about what we got earlier. Think about how amazing that was. Sure. Let's agree. We got some amazing stuff. Let's keep going, you know? And um, that's been the biggest thing. Sometimes I, there's been a few years that I've had an actor that maybe the other actors aren't jiving with. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to work through that, you know? Uh, sometimes you have a crew member who's talking garbage and trying to be poison. And you have to, I, I'll just go to the producer and I'll say, hey, I've, I heard this crew member talking. Can you please go have a powwow with them? Because that's part of the producer's job. I, I, as a director, I'm... I shouldn't be handling that. I need to be focused on the actors, you know? Sure. So I think those are the things usually I have enough eyes on the script before I send it out that we feel like the story is good and solid. But once again, sometimes you lose a location or sometimes it's raining and you have, you film, you, you wrote an entire script. It wasn't supposed to rain. You wrote an entire script that takes place outdoors. Um, and sometimes you were planning for the rain, but the rain's not supposed to come till 5 PM and it comes at 2 PM, you know? Right. Um, and that's part of that problem solving. How do you turn those things into gold mines? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, once again, filmmaking is problem solving. And uh, well, I would say in listening to you, you really emphasize it's collaborative and it's problem solving. And it's the key is having um, these extra person, whether it's in the form of a producer or uh, sometimes it could be a script supervisor, but somebody who is kind of, if you're busy with the actors, somebody who's keeping the eye on the clock and and all these other things that are happening and having that good relationship, that's what I'm hearing. It makes a big yeah. difference. Oh, I mean, that, and that's, that is, you know, the thing, I think the reason I've made so many 48s is because I love the people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and meeting new people. I've met so many collaborators on the 48 that have gone on to be people that I work with all of the time. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, it's such a great thing. And it's usually, it's so funny, you know, at the end of day two or the end of Saturday, usually you have half of the people going, I will never ever do this again they're exhausted they've been they've been uh, on set for 18 hours they're just exhausted they're frustrated um and then by the time you get to the screening they're all asking you hey are we going to do this again next year i can't wait to be on your team. Right. you know that's great so yeah super well we're coming to the close of this do you have any uh final words of advice for our filmmakers again thinking specifically of they've come up with their script they've got to get it in the can Maybe ending on anything that you do that helps prepare it for the editor. 
Uh, you know, we edit as we go. That has been at least for the last four or five. We have we have people who run the the footage to the editor. So editor, um, and if I mean, if you have the luxury of your editor having an assistant editor mm-hmm. or a co-editor, oh, it's a dream. Right. Um, so we've been doing that since 2013, I think. Uh, I've always had uh, an editor and a co-editor, nice. and it's huge. I mean, it's such it's such a way because. Someone can go to sleep and the other one can, can drive the ship for a while and then and swap. Um, a lot of the times when we finish, this is just my rhythm. Um, some years we've had our music, our post audio and our editor all in the same house. That's happened like t- twice. That was, a, no, three times. That was amazing to have everybody, for me as a director, to just go, cool, hey, edit's going well. I'm going to bounce over to music and talk to them for a few minutes. Sure. Cool, I'll bounce over to sound. Sound can be there and be like, guys, when are you going to rap? I need to do certain, you know, really great. Um, but if you're able to do that, it's nice to be able to just run that footage to your editor and have them edit as you go. Because that way, for me, when I'm done filming, I usually go straight to the, to the composer. Mm-hmm. That's the very first place I go right when we've wrapped. And I go, show me what you've got music wise. They play me everything they've got. And I go, I love this. I love this. This isn't going to work. What if you use this here? What if you do this here? Can you give me three variations of this? And I think this is going to be great right in here. I've got to go to the editor. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> I just leave. Sure. Um, and then I go to the editor. They show me what they have. And the beautiful thing is they've already edited together scenes of almost the entire film, except for like maybe the last nice. three hours. So they show me what they have. I give them some quick notes and I say, hey, I'm gonna go sleep for three hours. If, if I am not sitting next to you in three hours, come throw cold water on me. I go sleep for three hours, I come back and, and, then, we're, and we're back into it. So uh, once again, it's, it's figuring out, and we figured out all of that before we ever started, before we drew a single thing out of a hat. Sure. You know, all of that is already decided, you know, and so um, whatever your rhythm is getting that established early on is that pre-production is going to save you so much. Everybody knowing that we're shooting uh, 23.97, you know, everybody knowing that, you know, this, all these different things, that is super important. Um, and then in the end, I, one of the things I really try to do is, is I want to share ownership. You know, I want, I always want my team to know that I value them so much. Right. And that is, I mean, beca- you know, and I tell them thank you thousands of times um, because I'm not a solo filmmaker. I'm a director, you know, yeah. and I, I rely on these amazing people. And, uh, and I'm very thankful that they trust me to guide the show. Well, those are great words to end on, and uh, we thank you for sharing everything with our audience and for taking the time to be with us, and I hope we'll have you back for a future episode. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time and uh, for letting me be here. Alrighty. Bye-bye.